Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Welcome and thank you for being bold and proactive to explore and bring new resources that will change the lives of your students, teachers, and families. After this session, you will have the tools and ability to bring these changes and prepare students for challenging courses or careers in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, or known as STEM. Or you may have students who are struggling with the STEM content or developing STEM soft skills, such as critical thinking, creativity, innovation, collaboration, and communication, and just need a little extra help. If you haven't done so already, please look at the session on Grant Basics that was recorded and is posted on ESU 10's YouTube channel. Uh, that session covers basic grant development tactics that will help you in developing a grant proposal, whether that's for STEM, reading, the arts, history, PE, et cetera. The basic session provides the foundation for our multi-layered grant proposal cake. Um, this session on STEM will provide yet another layer of grant proposal development strategies. And we've also done a session on grants for literacy uh, proposals. So if that's of interest to you, you can uh, also find it on ESU 10's YouTube channel. And if you watch all three um, sessions, you will have a very nice uh, three layered grant proposal skill cake. This session will focus on classroom grants for schools and classrooms, uh, tips for designing STEM proposals. I'll share an example of a STEM grant outline, a STEM funding sources uh, for classrooms and schools. I've done a grant search. Uh, I'll share and highlight a few potential funding sources for, for you. And then some grant services that are available uh, to you. Now remember the key tip to write a proposal that you're comfortable with, and then look for funding opportunities that align with what you want. This will benefit you and your students by first, quickly responding to funding opportunities. And two, you won't chase after funding opportunities that are not really what you want. This will help fend off the dreaded scope creep where you trace the dollar and end up having to do more than what you really wanted. Um, like you wanted to create a maker space or, or create space in your classroom and find a funding opportunity that will pay for it if you have your students create landscape designs for your school. Now, while a landscape design may be good, would you rather have students exploring their own interests? Now, here's some grants for classrooms and schools. Um, grants typically range for uh, between $100 to $200 or to $20,000 for classrooms or $20,000 to $100,000 for schools. Um, as the dollar amount goes up, Sometimes the reporting requirements become a bit more intense, um, but for grant funded projects for classrooms, uh, I, I, I rarely see the reporting requirements being more than what you're already doing. So um, you just have to put that into your schedule as you're uh, getting ready to manage that grant as far as uh, when time deadlines and things are coming up. And if you can keep on top of it, uh, the reporting requirements are not really that onerous. Here, uh, another carryover from the grant basic session. Um, these are the standard grant proposal sections uh, that most, if you're working on your outline or your uh, grant proposal template, uh, if you include these eight sections in your uh, efforts, uh, you'll normally answer and have them available to respond to funding opportunities uh, that are commonly asked for in grant applications. Um, this is um, a proactive grant process that I use and I've been using them for years. 
Um, and that starts with creating what you want and then being flexible to respond to opportunities that you identify or that come up uh, in your proposal development um, process. And for today, we're really gonna be looking at these first three elements here, developing an outline, researching uh, funding opportunities and developing a grant proposal template. Now, tips for designing uh, STEM proposals. If you watch the grant basic session, some of these elements um, were covered, so I won't go into great deal to uh, great much, a lot of detail today. Uh, however, we, there are new tactics and strategies that I've found particularly useful in STEM proposals, and that's what we'll talk a little bit about today. So in the need section, these that are not bold in bold uh, are ones that we addressed in the grants basic session. But um, one area that is particularly, that I found particularly impactful when I'm working on a STEM grant is that I look for opportunities for students to develop STEM soft skills. These are things that businesses, um, in schools are always saying when we, when they get students from high school, they may not have the collaboration skills that we're looking for or the critical thinking skills, so on and so forth. So if I'm looking on a STEM proposal, I'm looking to say to a funder, um, in addition to improving students' content skills, which can be measured through standardized assessments uh, a, lot of, a lot of times, um, I want to, to address um, the deficits for opportunities uh, for students to develop soft skills. So what the, could this be? So there are some questions you can ask yourself. Do students, students need more classroom or school presentation opportunities? How well are small group activities structured? Is collaboration a key goal in those activities? Are students working on projects that bring new opportunities or change in the condition of people in your school or community? Are there opportunities for students to explore their own interests? Are students challenged with projects or problems that demand new ways of thinking about the problem? And how is failure acknowledged? In project design, um, another carryover from our grant basic session, this table is a great, um, way of outlining your, your project design section. Um, and uh, for STEM proposals, uh, ensure that there are experiential learning opportunities for students to allow them to explore and develop STEM skills. Um, so this could be maker space time uh, during class or after school or before school for students to explore interests. Uh, internships or job shadowing or um, uh, tours of, with area STEM businesses um, or projects that can result in an individual or community benefit. These are all things that when you're working on your project design, uh, try to include some type of experiential learning opportunity um, for, that for that student or your project. Management. If you are partnering with a business or outside agency like a college or university, share expertise in STEM, with the, in STEM that that partner provides. A lot of STEM proposals I've worked on have included outside partners, whether that's a business partner or a post-secondary partner or both. This makes STEM proposals a little bit different than say a literacy proposal that may depend largely on internal school resources, such as teachers, paras, specialists, et cetera. If you are partnering with an outside agency, make sure to include them in your project de design development, such as sharing your outline with them and seeking their input. And work hard to provide that partner with value, such as time with students through mentoring opportunities, uh, coaching opportunities, expertise, having students from your school go out to the, that business, for example, and tour and see what type of skim, STEM skills uh, are in practice every day at that business. Evaluation. 
unless you are a STEM content teacher, like a chemistry or math teacher, it can sometimes be hard to evaluate STEM, especially because you are doing, if you're doing a maker space, failure in designing a product or project is success because students were confronted with a challenge, try different approaches, and maybe the students fail to conquer the challenge. In a STEM universe, that failure is considered a success because students may have been engaged in the engineering process that they found out what didn't work. And perhaps they found a process that did work, but just didn't have the opportunity to figure out other issues. So how do you show student progress? How does a funder know if its money was able to accomplish condition change? Well, here's some ideas. When it was through, with learning management systems like PowerSchool, or infinite campus, you can flag students who are engaged in the STEM activity to see if their performance in other subjects, STEM related or other, have changed while they were working on the STEM challenge. Share examples of engineering notebooks or portfolios with the funder so the funder can see how students thinking processes changed over time. Use pre and post surveys to show student knowledge base or ad, attitude uh, changes uh, over time. Invite a funder into your school so it can see students engaged in STEM. This is particularly helpful if you're at midpoint or towards the end of your um, project. If you can invite the business that provided you with a $500 grant or a thousand or $5,000 grant to come in and see, all right, here's what your investment's doing. Here's how we have used your resources wisely. And that helps establish a partnership uh, between you and a business or post-secondary institution so that in the future you can expand and improve uh, your grant funded project or perhaps come up with a new one that that funder uh, may want to provide funding for. Timeline. <clears throat> now I like to use um, include a culminating activity in STEM projects. And a culminating or a capstone activity is an opportunity to bring the wide range of learning in STEM to a finer and concluding point. Um, students can work on a project and showcase skills and knowledge to the community um, and a funder through a culminating activity. Um, and including such an activity in your outline uh, will show the funder that there is a process or a sequence of learning that will result in a tangible product or learning outcome. For example, if you've had a makerspace or a gaming uh, opportunity, a gaming um, activity that's been going on, and you're able to bring a funder in to say, okay, at the end of the school year or the, the project that you asked the funding for, um, Here's where students were, and here where the, here's where they are now, and perhaps have students come up and do a five minute presentation on what they learned through this grant funded project. That can be a culminating activity, or in the era of COVID, if you're not able to invite uh, outside parties into your school, you can do a recording and post it on your YouTube channel uh, at school or on social media to show that, the, that this is what uh, was learned in this activity. So I always like to include some type of culminating activity in a STEM related proposal. This is uh, one of the bonus sections on sustainability. Uh, try to keep in mind that equipment purchased with grant funds is a, sus is a sustainable strategy and activity because uh, while well, technology changes from year to year, some of the base technologies do not. Um, for example, if you buy uh, tablets um, with grant funds, uh, those tablets, if they're well taken care of, can continue for a good number of years after uh, the grant funding is over. So I like to include that in as a sustainability tactic um, to say, you know, we'll continue to, to use this equipment in this project. Um, long after the grant funding is over. This is another bonus. Um, now, 
uh, depending on school policy, consider inviting the media in to see your STEM project in action. If you have a community partner like a business, uh, your partner will appreciate the exposure and you can use the tape or the article to apply for other funding. So you can show another funder, hey, we did great with, uh, with this, this project. We're now ready to take it to another level. Um, and here's what somebody from the outside who came in, here's what they saw us doing. Um, I also like to share stories with a funder at midpoint of the grant. Um, if you include a continuous improvement process in your timeline and your project design, where you sit back and you look at the data, uh, look at how students are progressing, uh, any challenges that you've had uh, in delivering content or in activities, it gives you a chance to kind of reset the, the game um, and come up with different strategies to improve student learning outcomes. Well, while you're doing that, there are un undoubtedly going to be some success stories that you've had up to that point. And a quick email to the funder to say, hey, you know, uh, thank you for the grant that you provided to us in August. It's now December. I just want to give you a quick snapshot of uh, how your uh, investment in this project has resulted in student gains and a quick two or three sentence about a student um, success uh, with a funder that will remind the funder that hey we did provide a hundred dollar grant or a five thousand dollar grant to this entity and this is the success they've had with it budget um, this is a table that i use in uh, developing my temp my grant proposal template. Uh, in some cases, I'm able just to copy and paste that into another grant proposal. And so I don't have to do any work on it, but I like using this because it's a very um, basic uh, table. Um, it helps me to show my work and that's important because um, it does a couple of things. First of all, it reminds you of what you were requesting. You may submit an application in October, but you may not find out if you've been funded until March or April. Well, that interval, you know, you're, you've moved on with life um, and you may not remember exactly what you were asking for. So this budget is a quick reminder that, hey, in October, we said we were gonna spend $600 uh, on, on tablets for $9,000. And though that's just a quick reminder. I like to keep it simple. So uh, a fifth grader could look at this and kind of have an idea of what we're proposing. Don't fluff. And fluffing is adding superfluous or unrelated items to the budget, like a classroom STEM grant budget for 27 students that includes 500 or 100 iPads. This puts a big red, big red flags with funders. And I know some grant reviewers We'll start reviewing our grant by looking at the budget first, because it is sort of an outline of what the proposal wants to do. And some look at the budget and they see if it doesn't make sense or there's some fluffing going on. They don't even bother to read the narrative portion. They just give the proposal a bad score and move it on. Uh, consider in-kind contributions. An in-kind contribution is a non-monetary support that is provided to a project. This can be the cont contribution of time, such as a business allowing employees to mentor students while on the clock with the business. For that, the employee's time in your project is an in-kind contribution. Or a business providing surplus materials to a project, like excess 3D uh, printing filament. Or a school providing a teacher with time to review data and plan for grant-funded project. So in this case, the teacher's hourly rate and or a substitute teacher that is hired to cover the teacher, those can be an in-kind contribution to the project. Processes in action. Um, I won't go in a great detail here because you can look at this uh, at your leisure, but here's a STEM grant outline that I've used uh, for a project. I took out some identifying characteristics of the school that I used it for, but um, this is just an example of a, a design that I used. It's very 
um, what outline-ish, outline-ish, I guess a standard outline. Um, and some of these, I don't go into great, great detail in my outline because this is just for my own internal use. These are just like placeholders I consider in my application. So I know I'm gonna have a cost for subs and I know I have to figure in French benefit for subs. I know we're buying tablets um, and I know the workbook uh, we're gonna be buying. Those are just placeholders, I know that. And at a later time I can fill out in greater detail what those things are. Uh, here's a grant proposal worksheet. You may remember that from our previous um, grant basic section, which I also put this, uh, describe this. This is a worksheet that guides you through the grant idea development process. Uh, it challenges you to answer questions that will be asked by funders. Um, and then in the end, you can see by your, by your own self, if you're idea is grant worthy or if you need to do more work. And all of these questions have a rhyme and reason to them. For example, number 10 here, what broad categories of school needs or opportunities does your project address? Well, this in the example that I've created, these are all broad categories. Well, when I'm starting to look for grant funding opportunities, then I know that I can look for opportunities that fund STEM, that are funders that like to provide support for rural education or teacher development uh, or post-secondary involvement. Now I have a handful or four um, categories that I can look use my grant searches for and find funders that like those things. The spreadsheet. Um, you will have access to the spreadsheet and I will just go over a, a few of these that are involved in it. What I've done is I've tried to limit my spreadsheet to only uh, central Nebraska funding opportunities or those that are based in Nebraska or those that have an interest in our region. Uh, and I'll go over here, this uh, Bayer Fund for America's Farmers. Um, this is one I've written a bunch of these. Uh, it used to be that you could apply for a $25,000 grant or a $10,000 grant or a $15,000 grant. Well, Bayer has reimagined uh, its approach and now it is offering just $5,000 grants. Um, so while that's not a, a large uh, award for a classroom, it might be just what you're looking for. And so the nice thing about this is, is that if you're nominated by a farmer for a grant, Bayer will contact you and say, hey, um, Farmer Jones has nominated you for a $5,000 grant. What is the STEM project you would do with this grant? And if you had been proactive, a lot of your work is done. Um, and you just have to spend a you know, half hour, hour filling out an application and you're good to go. Uh, the Central Platte Natural Resources District. Uh, if you live in Buffalo County or Hall County, um, you, you're in within the Central Platte Natural Resources District and they have a lot of good out, uh, grant programs, um, outdoor classrooms, which uh, they want students to be, out, to be outside studying um, botany and other um, wildlife biology kinds of things. Um, and if that's something that it's all STEM related um, and they're really great people to work with um, and report requirements are all just a picture and a statement that you've spent the money as requested um, and students had success, hopefully they have. Uh, Casey's General Stores. If you have a Casey store in your community um, they have an application that's now open. Uh, this is October 7th, 2021. Uh, in fact, this week, I submitted a $20,000 grant um, for a project and the application itself is very easy. It took 20 minutes to do. So um, that was uh, something that you can look for. And there's a, a put in a link for 
um, that opportunity. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, community foundations. Uh, these are the hidden gems. If you're not aware of them, you should be um, in your community. Um, a lot of these foundations like Kearney, Grand Island, Lexington, North Platte, um, encompass the county in which they reside. So the Kearney Area Community Foundation has funds for communities and schools within Buffalo County. Um, you need to check with them or with your school to see if the, if you, the, if the Kearney or if the community foundation has a fund for your school. The only kind of different one here is the Nebraska Community Foundation, which is based in Lincoln. But some of our smaller counties and communities don't have the wherewithal to have their own freestanding community foundation. And so what some have done, uh, say Ord, for example, Valley County has established its foundation via the Nebraska Community Foundation. So if you're a school in Valley County and you're wanting to apply for funding, you can go to the Nebraska Community Foundation website, do a search for your community. Uh, it'll tell you what, if any, um, resources that are available to you and provides links to them. And you can see if there's been a fund established that you can apply for grant funding for. Uh, this is commonly used for scholarships, um, but there are some that do, uh, design, do have designated funds for community or educational improvement projects in specific communities. So that is a good one to check out. Uh, here are some services that are available to you that I can help you with as you're working on your grant proposal. I can review them for you and offer suggestions. It's your proposal. It's up to you to um, make improvements to them if you want or, if, or to agree or not agree with my suggestions. That's up to you. I can help with researching um, demographics. The new census is out. And it uses it has uh, demographics on school districts, so that might be helpful to you in showing need in your community, um, or researching evidence-based practices, or doing a grant search uh, specifically for the project that you're looking for. And of course, I can help with with writing. All that I ask is that you have the approval of your principal or superintendent before contacting me. Um, so that way, if a grant project doesn't have the support of a teacher uh, and a principal, uh, then the project is not, or a superintendent, then the project likely will not be successful. Um, and then just wanna make sure that we have, we get value for our time. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I'll do my best to respond. Keep in mind, we have recorded a session on grant basics and on literacy grants for classrooms and schools. So please go to ESU 10's uh, YouTube channel to see those sessions and um, you'll gain additional skills and you might find uh, resources or tactics that were described in one uh, session may apply to a proposal that you're working on. Thank you and I look forward to seeing great things uh, from your work.